All right, this is the Informatics Friday seminar. We have something new today. We have one of our own. The faculty members got together and said, wait, we have all these stars in our department and they give talks all around the world. Why don't we have them here? So that's what we're doing today. We've got Jeff Bowker, who's on our own faculty. He's a professor and he's director of the uh, Laboratory in Design and Value, Values and Design, something like that. <laughs> it's values is in there somewhere. Um, Jeff comes uh, to us from, um, Let's see, right before here was Pittsburgh and San Clara. Yes. Um, he is probably best known for his book uh, called Sorting Things Out with Lee Star, uh, Classification and Its Consequences. If you haven't read it, you should. Uh, it's very interesting about how our infrastructure and the way of classifying things gets us to think differently. Um, new book, uh, Boundary Objects and Beyond, Working with Lee Star, is an edited uh, volume. And you have a newer one than that, yes? No. No, okay. Working. One with memory in it. <laughs> Working at it, okay. Uh, but he joins us today to talk about why, what big data can't do. Welcome, uh, Jeff. Uh, thanks so much for the kind invitation, uh, for, the, for the kind, um, but actually both invitation and introduction, Judy. Um, I will be talking about what big data can't do. I'm going to start the, with, um, you very kindly gave an advertisement for this book, Boundary Objects and Beyond. Uh, at least I was actually a member of this department um, in the, uh, in the 19, late 1980s. Um, and this is a celebration of and about her work and really developed her work on boundary objects in really interesting ways. So if you're interested in that concept. Um, okay, I'm going to start with a picture that many of you will recognize. Um, some of you won't. Um, it's Hobbes' Leviathan. Um, and this is uh, you know, one of the great works of political science of the uh, late 17th century. Um, and you can see the way the figure of the sovereign is made up here. He's carrying the sword and he's wielding the, uh, he's wielding the scepter, um, but his body is made up of the citizens of the populace. So it's as if the, the state itself is just made up in a fairly unmediated fashion by all of these folks who make up the king's body, who make up the sovereign. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about today, and we're going to revisit this, uh, revisit this image at the very end, is that that's no longer a good way of describing how our politics work, how our identity works. We're much more through the mediation of big data, is how uh, the state and um, our identities are working today. So large, um, this is a, um, I love this image, this was a, um, um, an architect's plan for a 65-story uh, data tower, um, and the um, the architect Miletti says uh, the large libraries of the past were built often enough with majestic designs that reflected their importance in society. As data centres become repositories of all our knowledge and culture, we must not ignore them. There's something sort of funny about this because data is so boring. If you ever looked at a data, um, you know, at a, uh, a server farm or anything like that, I mean, it's just kind of racks and racks of racks and racks of machines. Um, but what he's pointing to here, what Maletti's pointing to, is that data and data processing and data analytics is moving into that central place in culture that used to be held by book learning and libraries and by the and you know by the mediated. Um, mediated attention through the, uh, through the written word. Um, so Babbage said of the printing press, Babbage at the origin of computing, uh, before the printing press the mass of mankind were in many respects almost creatures of instinct. Um, and, but now they could, uh, now the great were uh, encouraged to write knowing that they may accelerate the approaching dawn of that day which will pour a flood of light over the darkened intellects of their thankless countrymen. Um, basically nobody liked Babbage. Um, the higher homage, alike independent of space and time, which their mem memory for sh for shall forever receive from the gifted and the great. So what's happening here is a shift from this book-based culture to a data-based culture. A shift in identity from being an identity which is just made up of me, me and my body um, and uh, my own private life, and that being mediated through big data one way or another. Um, just to, many of you will be aware of similar slides to this, this uh, is a few years old now. Uh, it gives you just some ideas of the, um, the scope and scale of big data, 2.5 million e emails uh, sent a second, 
uh, 20 hours of video uploaded every minute on YouTube, 50 million tweets a day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's uh, this diagram represents the three V's: uh, volume, variety, and velocity. Um, but in the way of the world, that's now inflated, and it's gone up to five V's: volume, uh, velocity, variety, veracity, and value. It's nice to see value in there, anyway. Um, so the Internet of Things is one language which is used to describe uh, what's happening with big data. And here's a fairly stereotypical representation of it. I want to draw your attention to the figure in the top left here, um, where it's vehicle, asset, person, and pet monitoring and controlling. Um, and it's going to become something of a theme, that when we're getting into these, these control regimes, we're using exactly the same techniques to control people as pets as, and vehicles and assets. Uh, for those of you, and this is a bit of a theoretical, um, uh, theoretical bracket, so ignore at leisure, um, there are ways in which actor network theory is becoming more and more true. Because actor network theory was largely about flattening the divide between humans and non-humans and seeing it all in terms of a single analytic system. Um, and I can, but I won't go into details right now, but if anyone has a question about it, I can say why I think actor network theory is becoming more true a little bit later. Um, even the poor cows uh, can't get away from the internet right now. This is the internet of cows. Uh, as your car pedometers get dairies moving, uh, you want to know when your cow's going into oestrus, so you've got the best chance of getting a, getting a little kitty wink out of your cow. Um, and so poor old cows are in there as well. So what's going on? I'm going to tell the story in two parts. Because we often tell the story of big data as if, you know, big data is this huge thing that just happened to us um, a, couple of, um, you know, a couple of years back. Um, but it's a much longer story and a much longer arc. I'm going to be switching between these two arcs, and then I'm going to theorize the two arcs at the very end uh, of the talk today. Um, this machine, this device, is called a governor. Uh, it's at the heart of the um, heart of the um, um, heart of the uh, industrial revolution, the first industrial revolution um, in the um, early earlyish 19th century. Uh, it's based on controlling a steam engine. Uh, what you have here is you've got two bellows like this, and if the engine starts overheating, the bellows go up, they, cons they constrict the flow of oxygen to the, steam to the steam engine, so it starts to run cooler, then the bellows go down. So what, you what you're achieving is flatlining, you're achieving homeostasis. And um, this sense of putting into place control mechanisms, it's exactly what James Benninger talked about in his classic book about 30 years now called, called The Control Revolution. It's really through control um, that we can understand, through this prediction and control, uh, that we can understand a lot of what's going on today and a lot of what's been going on over the last couple of hundred years. Uh, skipping forward some, um, although actually not getting away from the governor, because uh, cybernetics itself comes from the Greek Kubernetes, which means governor. Um, this is Eden Messina's um, picture of uh, the control room that was envisaged for Allende uh, in Chile under the, um, under, the, um, yeah, un under, the, uh, under the communist government there. And the idea was that you would have this kind of control panel where you'd be in the center, the technocrats would be in the center here, they'd be receiving constant data flows uh, from factories, from uh, on traffic conditions, on social conditions all around Chile, and they'd be able to make instant decisions and move back into it. Uh, so this ability to monitor, predict, and control uh, has been a constant drive for the last little while. It is taking on new forms with big data. And I'm going to look at a couple of examples of prediction right now. Um, this is one that's in place in, um, in Santa Cruz. I think it's used in some parts of New York and certainly used in LA. Uh, predictive policing, predict crime in real time. PredPol provides targeted real-time crime prediction designed for and successfully tested by officers in the field. Um, actually, very hard to say it was successfully tested. The way in which PredPol works uh, is they, um, they take an algorithm, which is an algorithm that was used to, um, uh, to predict the aftershocks of earthquakes. So you've got a major earthquake and you want to predict aftershocks. They use that same algorithm, uh, again, flattening people and things, to predict if a crime's occurred in an area, where are the aftershocks most likely to occur? And we're then going to go out there and stop the crime before it happens. Now, we've already got one logical problem here with the nature of prediction, because there's no way of testing this. I mean, there's no way that you can know if 
the crime would have occurred or not, um, because you, you know, you're taking away the basis for it. Um, and they've had a huge difficulty in the field actually trying to, you know, actually trying to justify uh, the results of it, although it's such a nice toy that lots of people want to use it anyway. Um, the other problem with PredPol, uh, and I'll be coming back to this a few times as we talk about prediction, is this issue of what does it mean to a community to get stigmatized as a possible problem community where bad things are likely to happen. So that police presence is not a benign presence in the community. It's a presence which assumes that you're in a nasty neighborhood uh, where there's going to be crimes, and so we're going, to, we're going to be out there. So it's sending a very strong message. Uh, another form of prediction, uh, Bernard Harcourt has this wonderful book, Against Prediction, uh, which talks about the um, actuarial procedures in the criminal justice system. And the actu what he means by act actuarial procedures is you work out, you try and predict what chance a certain person has of recidivism, <laughs> of actually going back and committing another crime once they're released from jail, <clears throat> for example. Now, on the actuarial model that's used in the American prisons, uh, there is a, um, there's a test for socio sociopathy, for sociopaths, which if you score highly enough on, uh, you will never get out of jail because the parole boards will say if you're above 75% on this test, you've got an 80% chance of recidivism, therefore it's too risky to give you parole. Um, huge ingrained injustice in that because we know that it's only 85% who will fall back, so we know that 15% of innocent people will be locked up. But the prediction then becomes such a strong and determinative factor. Um, here's one. Um, fortunately, we didn't end up with Ted Cruz. Um, <laughs> look at the alternative. Um, <laughs> Ted Cruz using the firm that, um, that harvested data on millions of unwitting Facebook users, Cambridge Analytica. So let's just read what they do and then I'll, then I'll theorize it a bit. Um, communication has changed. Blanket advertising no longer provides a uh, viable return on investment for every campaign. Big data revolutionized the way organizations identify and locate their best prospects. But data, uh, data alone is not, not enough. Cambridge Analytica is building a future where every individual can have a truly personal relationship with their favorite brands and causes by showing organizations not just where people are, but what they really care about and what drives their behavior. So Cambridge Analytica, the way in which they worked this particular case, um, they got a number of people on Amazon Mechanical Turk. They harvested um, their, um, their profiles <coughs> and used that to snowball. So they built up this huge, um, this huge database of profiles. And then they use that to predict which particular message um, Ted Cruz could send to that particular group, just as the brands will change according to, um, brand advertising will change according to um, what they know about your preferences. Um, there's a way in which, for me, this ties into an absolutely fantastic um, uh, science fiction story by Philip K. Dick called Faith of Our Fathers. And in Faith of Our Fathers, um, everybody takes a, um, a collective hallucinogen. It's in the water supply probably not noticed. Um, and when you look at the TV, um, you actually see this single world dictator. Um, and so you see this single figure. When you stop taking the hallucinogen, you actually see that the figure is very, very multiple. So you see an alien, you see a ravening beast, you see a robot. Um, and so what Ted Cruz is doing and Cambridge Analytica are doing here is trying to create this very odd picture where there is no real Ted Cruz. Everybody's got their own personal Ted Cruz. Um, and, it's, you know, and it's only, um, you know, it, it's only if we go to places like the debates that we imagine that, that there is a single Cruz out there. So again, using prediction to control <coughs> behavior. Um, I'm not going to spend a long time on this because this will be so familiar to many of you. Um, this is the um, target, uh, the target case where they discovered target works out that a pregnant woman um, is going to give birth to a baby before she's made the, um, been able to tell her father about it, her parents, who then got very angry. Um, but what I do want to point to is Janet Battisti, who's a fantastic researcher. Uh, she tried to hide her pregnancy um, from the big data gatherers. Uh, the only way that she could hide her data, she said, was by acting like a criminal. Uh, she had to carry around sacks of money. She had to um, move to different parts of town, never stopping in, uh, shopping in the same, same store twice. She started using Bitcoin um, because Bitcoin was not traceable in the same way that credit card transactions are traceable. 
So the only way in which he could kind of opt out of this system, which is a fairly pernicious predictive system, was by taking on criminal behavior. Let's bring this a little closer to home. This is a, um, this is a um, program that actually went in last summer now at the Open University. A week out in England. A week after students begin their distance learning courses at the UK's Open University this October, a computer program will have predicted their final grade. An algorithm monitoring how much the new recruits have read of their online textbooks, how keenly they've engaged with web learning forums, will cross-reference this data against, uh, will cross-reference this information against data on each person's socioeconomic background. It will identify those likely to founder and pinpoint, um, and pinpoint when they will start struggling. Throughout the course, the university will know exactly how hard, um, will know how hard students are working by continuing to scrutinize their online reading habits and test scores. Now what's wrong with this picture? I mean, it seems like such a benign thing. We want to catch the problem students before they actually get into difficulties. Let me give you two problems um, with this mode of data collection. Uh, the first problem is what my friend um, John King calls the second year slump. Uh, students, when they get into university, they're really excited they're in their first year, they want to do really well, they're highly competitive, get straight A's on their courses. The next year, they discover sex and drugs and rock and roll, and their <laughs> grades tend to go down. Then third year, it's, oh my god, I need a job at the end of the day. Um, so the grades start to go up again. Now the question is, what is the status of that second year slump? For me, that second year slump is an absolutely vital part of growing up. It's just part of being alive. Um, but what the, no, what, the no, what, the, um, what the learning analytics programs, unthinking, they don't have to be this way, but what the unthinking ones are doing is trying to tie you to a normative temporality. They're trying to say, this is the temporal curve which will affect your life. You should be maximally efficient all of the time at exactly the same rate. Um, another one which I'm... Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. The, and the other problem with this, as far as I'm concerned, is, um, again, as with the predict predictive policing, you're predicting someone's going to be a problem student, and so you start to intervene with them. And that's kind of an, an inverse Hawthorne effect. Um, if you've told somebody they're going to be a problem and then intervene with them, you're already in a problem with them. You've already created a problem for them by the very act that you're intervening in that way. And I find that morally uh, very questionable. Uh, there's another one... Oh, all right, we'll use the example, I'm very sad because I know of a recent case. Um, GoGuardian um, is a tool for preventing suicide. Get the most out of your school's Chromebooks. Chromebooks are a great way for teachers to engage with students and provide access to resources. But with that opportunity comes potential for students to stumble across harmful content uh, or become distracted by videos, games, social media, and more. Um, now again, there's something problematic about this, um, and I don't want to belabor this point too much because I'm not too sure about it, um, but Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, you know, the great existentialist, said the one freedom we have is the ability to kill ourselves, to suicide. And if we start stopping people from harboring those thoughts before they even get to harbor them, um, I think that prevents growth in many ways. I mean, I certainly, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be the mess that you see before you today. Um, had I not, uh, at various points in my earlier life, harbored suicidal thoughts. I didn't want interventions at that stage. I wanted to go through that process. So it's, it's again, it's putting your identity through a big data hopper and then coming back and feed into you so that you will never know if you would have committed a crime. You will never know if you would have been a problem student. You will never know if you would have thought of or actually committed suicide. We're going to do it in such a way because your identity is actually flowing through these databases. That's the way that they operate. Um, uh, I'm actually very pleased to announce, Simon Buckingham Shum, my friend, insisted that I put this out, um, that the Open University has put in, in the place uh, a policy on the ethical use of data for student, uh, student data for learning analytics. Very few universities around the world have done that. Um, I'm pretty certain we don't have an ethical policy. It's turning into a huge business right now, learning, learning analytics. Be fantastic if we have one at our university. Um, okay, here's one that I got terrified by last year. Um, this is an executive order from Barack Obama, uh, one of the few powers that he has. 
um, in, um, um, in a divided Congress. Uh, it's called Using Behavioral Science Insights to Better Serve the American People. Um, and let me read um, the, third, the middle item there, number three. Identify programs that offer choices and carefully consider how the presentation and structure of those choices, including the order, number, and arrangement of options, could most effectively promote public welfare as appropriate, giving particular consideration to the selection and setting of <coughs> default options. Now, firstly, I'm rather sad. Is this what behavioral science has come to? Um, you know, manipulating people on how they fill out um, on how they fill out forms, or you know, whether you opt in or opt out for particular data. It seems a really sad concept of what what it is. But it's also notice what's happening here. They're taking the big data, they're using it to run through the mill and predict what you're going to do, and then on the basis of that prediction, they're going to feed you options in a certain way. Um, it's a kind of paternalist form of government. The government knows what's best for you, so they're going to encourage you to make the right choice, but not encouraging in this Habermasian sphere of uh, public sphere where there's actually rational discourse. It's not even a language game, uh, as Leo Tao would talk about a language game. This is just behind the scenes. You will be manipulated in such a way that you will um, choose the right and the careful thing. And what's odd about each of these three cases I've just talked about is each of them seems pretty nice and benign, and each of them have very, very strong arguments for them. I'm deliberately giving you the arguments against them, but um, um, <laughs> any time I can just invert that. Um, what I find interesting about, um, about Barack's executive order um, was it's so closely tied in with Natasha Dow Schull's fantastic book, um, Addiction by Design. And Addiction by Design is about, well, how do they, um, how do the casinos in Las Vegas and elsewhere, how do they get you addicted? How do they work with you? Um, well, a couple of things. One is um, they, um, they observe your betting patterns uh, as they collect the data about you. And as they observe the betting patterns, they work out how much money they can get out of you over, the, over your lifetime. Uh, for me, that's going to be about 40 bucks. Um, but for many people, it'll be the order of tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and so how, how do they get that information? Well, a couple of things. They do... Um, they do um, uh, was it frequent, um, frequent gambler cards? So they can use those to track uh, where you eat, what you eat, what shows you go to, what machines you most like, how much money you spend at the table. However, not satisfied with that, uh, they actually have cameras in each of these slot machines uh, which have automatic face recognition. So if you've decided you want to be private in the casino, they'll use the automatic face recognition to build up a profile of you, and that profile will then move around with you. Um, so even though you're quote unquote anonymous, you're not really, really anonymous uh, in this process. And what's interesting here is that exactly the same technologies are being suggested, nudge technologies are being suggested um, by Barack Obama and deployed by the casino industry. Um, just another form of addiction, really. Um, the, um, well, I hope I'm not putting them drifting on it. Okay, so let's look at some of the things that really get left out of big data. We've already seen, you know, we sort of see one thing that's really left out, which is, you know, that possible future which is being cut off. Big data can, you know, is being used to try and cut off possible futures. Um, now, when we think about big data, we often think about it as, you know, pipes and whistles and this really key, key, clean flowing process with this raw data coming in and analytic insights coming out the other end of the equation. Um, this is my much um, happier picture of what infrastructures look like. They're covered together with duct tape. Thank you, car talk. Um, duct tape wiring, this, this connects to this. You know, your, you know, your forearms connected to you, whatever. Um, so in this messy infrastructure, there is stuff that you really, really can't find out um, through big data. Uh, the Guardian newspaper in England, this is uh, this morning's headline, uh, so far, the police have killed 824 people um, in the US this year, about. It's very hard to get that information. Until recently, uh, Obama has now uh, asked the FBI to build up um, a standardized database for it. But police deaths are defined very differently in different jurisdictions. They're not reported to a national database. That data can only exist by these people are combing local newspapers. Um, they're combing police reports and they're sending that information to the Guardian, 
who are then taking it and collating it. Uh, 824 is a good number, by the way, we should crack 1,000 by the end of the year. Um, you can see the Native Americans and the blacks um, disproportionately killed on that. Um, now, here's one um, that I find interesting. And this is a representation of Chernobyl. Um, <laughs> I love the gendered nature of it. You've got this guy in this radi full, full radiation jacket and this poor woman just kind of milking a cow. Um, but the reason of being in Chernobyl is we have no idea how many people were killed in the Chernobyl disaster. And you think that would be a sort of thing we would have data about. Because in this world of collecting all health data all of the time, why don't we know how many people died in Chernobyl? Uh, and this is drawing on Olga Kuchinskaya's Kuchin work. Um, in the first place, we don't know because um, the, um, the radius around Chernobyl that was taken for um, analyzing deaths was, I think, something like a 12 kilometer radius um, around the Chernobyl nuclear site. So they didn't even collect data um, about people um, outside of that area. And we know that a lot of deaths actually occurred um, in very distant sites where the radioactive rain came down. Um, the um, second reason is they only track thyroid cancer deaths. They take thyroid cancer, which is the most common death, or a very common death from radiation poisoning. They take that as what they track. So there's an invisibility, which is sort of being written into the big data there, such that um, I, did a, uh, I did a search, and I found the following, um, uh, the following um, figures for the people officially killed by, or people killed in Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. It ranges from 49 to 3,000 to 60,000 to a 1 million. So it's somewhere between 50 and a million, um, you know, which is you know, within several standard deviations of the truth, no doubt. Um, this is um, a very similar one. This is about, um, this is about um, fracking. Um, it's extremely difficult to find out what the dangers of fracking are. Uh, let me read through this before I explain it a bit. There was a clear disconnect between the EPA's top line spin that there was no evidence of widespread systematic impacts on drinking water from fracking and the actual content of the study which highlights data limitations, open questions and clear evidence. Um, let's see, uh, we're pleased that members of the Science Advisory Board have seen fit to highlight uh, the disconnect and call on the Obama administration to address numerous high profile cases of fracking contamination inexplicably left out of the study. Um, the study was not comprehensive. It relied heavily on data already collected by state and federal agencies or willingly submitted by gas and oil companies. And there was something of a suspicion going on that maybe they only willingly gave the data away if the data would have them smelling, up, smelling like roses at the other end of the equation. So it's, it, it's an invisibility that's getting built in to the system. And that is, you know, in some, in some cases it's a very deliberate policy and in some cases it's very accidental. But the world of big data is not, you know, it doesn't matter how many sensors you've got in the world, it doesn't matter how much you think you're getting about people all of the time and about events all of the time. There are these systematic areas of invisibility, these systematic areas which are being built into big data programs. Um, fortunately, Lumos um, solved the, um, solved the, the um, Chernobyl problem. They've worked out how to quantify the invisible. Um, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on forgetting too now and the role of forgetting. I'm actually going to go through this fairly quickly, so excuse me because I want to get to the end of the talk later. Um, so forgetting is something, um, most often you think that you've got a pretty good memory for some stuff. Uh, this is an example of flashbulb memory. More facts of nature, all forest animals to this very day remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when they heard that Bambi's mother had been shot. Um, I was getting ready to cross the interstate. I was down by the edge of the lake at the time. I was looking for crawdads in my favorite creek. Um, and flashbulb memory is that sort of thing that, um, you know, um, where were you when JFK died for the older members of the audience like myself? Where were you when John Lennon was shot? Where were you um, at 9-11, whatever, whatever. Um, so, you think that flashbulb memory is seared into your brain um, as being a completely accurate memory. Ulrich Neisser, the cognitive scientist, did a study of flashbulb memories and found that 83% of them are, were inaccurate. It's either 83 or 88%. Um, people tend not to remember the actual events. Uh, they remember the sort of thing that was going on at the time. 
So you remember that you, you know, your, your brother bought a bright yellow Citroen that year. I'm thinking of a specific case. And so you associate the Citroen with the flashbulb memory, even though that model didn't come out until after the Citroen, uh, until um, uh, before the Citroen um, had been built. Um, so forgetting is really, really central um, to the way in which we play with our databases. And forgetting is a really huge part of what we do. This is a reference um, many of you will know, and I am going to give away the plot, so cover your ears if you don't like spoilers. Um, this is a reference to the film Memento. Um, and in Memento, the person, uh, the protagonist, has lost all his short-term memory. Um, and he thinks that his wife has been killed. Um, and so he tattoos messages onto his body, um, which will enable him to, to track uh, what happened to his um, what happened to his um, what happened to his partner, uh, and it turns out, and this is the twist at the very end of the movie, is that he lied to himself in his tattoos. Um, so the tattoos are telling a false story of what went on, um, but he's deliberately created a database which remembers certain kinds of events in such a way that it will turn to an external killer. Um, forgetting is an absolutely central part of society. Um, Basically, uh, actually, I once wanted to do a side study of this. There are various acts of oblivion through the ages. After the, um, after the um, uh, Athenian civil war in the uh, late, um, early fourth, uh, no, late fourth century um, BC, the, um, uh, there was an act of oblivion. You are, you are not allowed to talk about the civil war. Um, very much the same thing happened uh, after the English Revolution. Uh, you're not allowed to talk about it, therefore it doesn't exist. Now the thing is, once you actually take something out of discourse, it's really, really easy to forget. If, um, there's an old, um, there's an old um, uh, musical joke, uh, musical line, which is, forget I said that. Um, but it actually turns out that if you say to someone, forget I said that, there's a very good chance they will forget you said it. Um, so it's actually very, it, it, it's a very effective device. Uh, so how is forgetting um, occurring on the web? Um, well, this is, um, some of you will have seen this before, but I love it so much, I'm going to go through it again. Uh, Google plans to destroy all information it can't index. Uh, executives at Google, a rapidly growing online company that searches, that pr promises to organize the world's information, announced Monday the latest step in their expansion effort, a far-reaching plan to destroy all the information it's uh, unable to index. Uh, users want the world to be as simple, clean, and as accessible as the Google homepage itself, said Eric Schmidt at a press conference. Soon it will be. The new project, dubbed uh, Google Purge, will join such services, popular services, Google Images, Google News, Google Maps, which catalog the, the, um, catalogs the US entire surface. Um, as a part of Purge's first phase, executives will destroy all copyrighted materials that cannot be indexed by Google. Um, now, there's a phrase for this. There's a way in which this is very real. Um, there's a phrase that Sanford Berman, uh, the great um, uh, bibliographer, used, which was death by bibliocide. Um, that if you miscatalog a book well enough in the, in the Library of Congress, no one is ever, ever going to be able to find it. Um, and I remember when, <laughs> remember when I turned up in a university in Australia once, um, and I was just browsing the archaeology cells um, uh, out of interest, and there was archaeology of Syria, archaeology of the ancient East, archaeology of knowledge. Um, and you don't sort of, you know, that's not where you'd expect archaeology knowledge to do. I mean, it, it's buried in the catalogue in that way. What they're doing, and what Google does, is it buries things. Um, so that um, a typical case is when you're looking for information out of an African country, such as Cameroon, uh, you will get, the, um, you'll get uh, information from the CIA World Book, from the BBC World Service, from all of these different agencies in the West, trusted sources in the West. And it takes a long time to get to something which actually comes out of Africa. So even though that information is there, even though the data is there, it's largely inaccessible because most people will not go past two pages uh, on a Google search. Um, there's also a massive business um, in destroying data. Uh, companies have been very aware of this um, over the last several years. Overwrite files so they cannot be recovered, can wipe an entire hard disk in order to be sure that a deleted file is really deleted, gone for good. Its contents never to be seen again. It's necessary to overwrite the data sectors of that file. Data destroyer purges files 
purges data in files where purge means to destroy, to completely eliminate by overwriting so the data cannot be recovered by any means. Um, so again, another kind of purge that's going on here. And this is a systematic purge which is happening right through industry all of the time. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. So what we are remembering again in the world of big data is the stuff that's um, been cleaned up um, and we've, we're, we're choosing to forget um, or it so happens that we do forget um, lots of what's really important that's going on. Uh, yes, by the way, I mean, just, yeah, just, just on the Google point there, I mean, it reminds me that um, uh, the UC, uh, was the UC Davis pepper spray incident, uh, where the UC spent $175,000 to push um, searches about pepper spray and UC Davis down the Google ranks. So that wouldn't be the first thing you'd see when you saw uh, when you went to check out UC Davis. Wonderful use of taxpayers' money. Um, I'm now going to talk um, about the um, question of identity. And the question of identity is this. I've alluded to it before, but I now want to theorize it a little bit, uh, a little bit more deeply. Um, the question of identity is, um, is big data collecting information about me, or is it also forming who I am um, so that I am indistinguishable um, from my big data, which is the argument that I'm going to run. I'm going to start with my favorite um, uh, my favorite pragmatist philosopher, Arthur Bentley. Um, I'll just read this, the human skin philosophy's last line of defense. The human skin is the one authentic criterion of the universe which philosophers recognize when they appraise knowledge under their professional rubric, epistemology. Uh, by and large, except for a few great critics and skeptics, they view knowledge as a capacity, attribute, possession, or other mysterious inequality of a knower. They view this knower as re residing in an in or outer body, they view the body as cut off from the rest of the world by the skin. Um, all of which holds for philosophizing physicists and psychologists, even as for professionals of the arcanum itself. Um, and Bentley, is, uh, from a pragmatist position, was arguing against that. And he was saying, look, the, the skin is just an artificial barrier um, for trying to decide who we are or what we are. And let me give you an analogy here. Um, the, um, no, actually, I'm not going to do that one. Uh, let's spend a little bit of time with Martha. Martha was the last passenger pigeon. Um, they died on uh, 1 p.m. September the 1st, 1914. Um, passenger pigeons used to be huge over the um, eastern seaboard of the United States. Um, millions of them. There'd be flights like this, flocks like this going on for days at a time. Unfortunately, they made very good pigeon pies and they flew low enough so that uh, people would just kind of stand in their backyards and shoot the pigeons out of the sky. Now, Stuart Brand, who's something of a visionary, uh, has decided he wants to recreate the passenger pigeon. Um, so he's doing genetic engineering to, um, to, um, to uh, breed backwards so we can actually get a new flock of passenger pigeons going on. Now the question here is, what is the unit of analysis when you're saving a passenger pigeon? Um, is it just the genetic information? In fact, these flocks were so huge um, that they um, changed the forest cover of the eastern seaboard of the United States. They nested preferentially in and <coughs> ate professionally uh, and ate certain kinds of nuts and not others. Um, and so we had a completely different forest cover before and after the passenger pigeon. So the unit of analysis there is not the information that's held in the genetic code. The unit of analysis is the passenger pigeon and the forest cover of the eastern seaboard. If you want to save the passenger pigeon, you need to recreate the forest at exactly the same time. Otherwise, you, you, you'll get something interesting, but it will not be a passenger pigeon, um, as, <laughs> as we understand passenger pigeons. Um, uh, I'll just show you this diagram. Um, yeah, this is um, insides and outsides. This should have come a little bit earlier in the skin slide. Uh, one way in which physiologists think about the human digestive tract is it's the outside within, uh, and it's only what pass goes through the ruptured mucous membrane, uh, goes through without rupturing the mucous membrane, um, is outside the body border. Um, with our cells, um, this uh, is this portrait by Joanna Riku, this lovely portrait. Um, our self-portrait of the human microbiome reminds us our cells are constituted um, 90% of the cells in your body are flora and fauna. 10% are 
are your genetic information. So the unit of analysis for you, um, there's a new book I've not read yet called We Are Legion, which discusses this. The unit of analysis for people is not what's happening inside your skin. Is, sorry, it's not what's happening inside your genetic structure, not, not what's determined by your DNA. The unit of analysis is the commonwealth of being that constitutes you. Uh, now, what I've been trying to argue um, in this talk, and oh, I'm going to have to skip a section. <laughs> sorry, uh, is um, what big data is doing is creating this data double. Um, and the data double um, is not separated from me. In all the ways that these predictive mechanisms are cutting, cutting me off, cutting off possibilities before they ever get the chance to arise, nudging me in, in certain directions and not others, there is no way that I am the same person in a world of big data as I was in a world before big data. It's just the self is constituted differently. Um, this is very similar to some kinds of arguments that uh, Michel Foucault made in the past, but I won't go into that. Um, all right, I'm not going to. Fortunately, you're going to miss a section. Um, all my fault. Um, I'll just throw that one in there. Um, the um, beauty contest was judged by AI, and the robots didn't like dark skin. Um, there's a lot of that right now. The, the, um, the algorithms that are being written um, to analyze these data sets uh, often produce systematic biases and systematic injustices. It's very difficult to find where and how the injustice is occurring, because there was no way in the algorithm um, that it actually said um, that it actually said we don't like dark colors, uh, uh, dark colored people. Uh, now the reason I skipped is because I generically do this talk and it sounds so negative, and I really wanted to spend a minute on optimism um, before I move into the peroration. Uh, what are causes for optimism here? Um, there's a beautiful book by uh, Slavoj Žižek called The Fragile Absolute with the highly ironic subtitle or why the Christian legacy is worth fighting for. And what he's saying there is that we shouldn't lose track in the midst of all this idea where we can niche market everything down, like Ted Cruz, we can niche market everything down to the granular level, to the atomic level. We can find out about you before you know about yourself. And he's saying, well, what we need to do to counter this is to recognize that there are commonalities across us and we need to be able to find together what those commonalities are and work with them. Um, another um, slight cause for Opticon, this is a, um, the Lund Halsey generic control room. Um, Bruno Latour has a very nice uh, phrase where he invites us to look at not panopticons, where panoptican, that's sort of the myth of big data, is they're trying to get all the information about everybody all the time, but look at oligopticons. And really, the state is generically only interested in looking at very small slices of data, enough to do the prediction and control. So understanding the nature of those oligopticons, recognizing their regularities and their systematic biases, we can absolutely do. Um, now, there's ways in which big data um, you know, fits into the globalization move. You know, and it's like, you know, basically, we're, you know, we're, all, we're all going to um, attach to the world through our favorite brands, to our politicians, through um, their marketing through all the data that's being collected around us. Um, this is just a reminder for me that um, um, there are more ABRA impersonators in, um, in Indonesia um, per capita than in any other country on earth. Um, um, the reason I'm bringing that out is because as well as these machineries of sameness, these machineries of big data which are trying to drive us into very, very similar patterns and doing the same thing all the time, every culture always has machineries of difference going on at the same time, even if it's ABBA, for heaven's sake. Um, it's important to recognize what the, um, what the site of politics is. Uh, Jonathan Gray has been doing some really interesting work on England, sorry, in England on changing what counts, uh, where he's been looking at um, citizen challenges um, to big data sets and citizen, um, citizen data collection uh, on the grounds that a citizen-generated civil society data can be used as an advocacy tool to change official data selection. Uh, I really like this example, as would apply obviously to the Masala Shale uh, that I talked to a little bit before. Um, finally, on the optimistic side, uh, we need to recognize, change the side of politics. Uh, Steve Jackson and um, Tom Gillespie talk about the design policy not. The site of politics right now is sort of here. When we teach politics in school or universities, 
We don't teach what's going on in databases. We don't teach how to read databases. We don't teach um, this central site. So I think we collectively as a community need to really start some serious meditations on the ways in which uh, data collection, data storage, um, you know, the 65-story data tower, this cathedral, of, uh, this cathedral of data, ways in which this um, is basically where and how politics is happening right now. Uh, won't do a Yahoo bash. Um, so I started at the beginning of the talk um, with the picture of the Leviathan, this unmediated picture. Uh, let me finish with a couple of images. Um, this is, I oh, just love these images. This is um, William Heath um, from 1828. Um, the phrase is from Robert Owen, The March of the Intellect. And the epigraph is, uh, oddly enough, Jeremy Bentham, who gave us the concept of the panopticon. Lord, how this world improves as we go older. Um, and it's really remarkable. This is from 1828. It's got um, a grand vacuum tube company, uh, which goes direct to Bengal from England. Um, Exactly the sort of thing that Elon Musk is thinking about doing to get us between um, uh, LA, and, uh, LA and, the, um, and the Bay Area. Uh, it's got a flying postman there who's delivering the post, just like little drones that we have today. Um, but the one I want to draw your attention to is the second picture he did, uh, which, is, which harks back to the Leviathan at the start of the talk. And let me read what this says. I come, I come, cries the great machine of intellect. I saw a vision, a giant form appeared. Its eyes were burning lights, even of gas, and on its learned head it bore a crown of many towers. Its body was an engine run by steam, and the legs on, and the legs on which it strode like under presses that men call printers use, and from whence fell ever and anon small books that fed the little people of the world. The little people of the world. I love the little people of the world. But you see here, that, I mean, this is the new Leviathan, where it's the information technology is absolutely constituting, um, is absolutely constituting the state and mediating the state in such a way um, that the march of the intellect can occur. Um, uh, I have time to do this. No. Sure. Uh, all right. All right. Th this will take about two minutes because it's um, because it's slightly tangential. Um, Michel Bastion. Uh, okay. The um, slowest computer in the world is a clock. Uh, it's a Stuart Brand again, the clock of the good long now, which basically strikes the hours every thousand years. Um, little cuckoo comes out and plays Brian Eno music, then it goes in again. And it's to remind us that we're not living um, you know, in this clock time. Now, Michel Bastion has written a brilliant paper, which she calls Fatally Confused, where she argues that clocks are not about an absolute measure of neutral time. They're about coordination. She says, we are fatally bound to two clocks, the clock of the computer going ever faster, which enables the circulation of communication, information, and price of market, um, uh, and the clock that used to be on our wrists, but is now ubiquitous in our cell phones and calendar apps. And the confusion that she's talking about in her case is that climate change doesn't fit into those coordinative mechanisms. Uh, so what's interesting about a lot, of, a lot of big data and a lot of management of big data is it's very good about things that fit into the clock time of the computer or fit into the clock time of your watches. It's very bad at things which operate at a different temporality. This is quite similar to the point, it's, it's quite akin to the point I was making at the very start of my talk, where I was talking about the, uh, the normative temporality. Uh, Jamie Schneider's also talking about normative temporality uh, in terms of um, bipolar patients in, um, in Washington. Let's get the appropriate sign curve for them. So a good bipolar sufferer should have the appropriate sign curve. But it's this normative temporality taking the clock and this ever faster clock at the center of the computer as being the ways in which we coordinate everything in life. And that, again, looking at what big data can't do. What it can't do is uh, deal very well with different kinds of temporality. And the kinds of temporality, and that's why, one reason why we find it so difficult to think and theorize climate change. It's partly just as simple as that. Very like uh, Piaget, when he talks about a child's conception of time and space, uh, where Piaget's argument, since disproved, but it's a great argument, um, is that um, kids have an intuitive understanding of relativity theory and quantum theory, um, but then they go to school, they learn Euclidean geometry, uh, and they learn uh, Newtonian physics, and they come out at the end of the day, and it all seems completely counterintuitive. Uh, so how does something go from being intuitive to counterintuitive? And we've worked out lots of beautiful intuitions through big data, but in order to understand what big data is, 
we need to understand what's not intuitive as well and what might become intuitive with different kinds of coordinated mechanism. Um, so two very last slides then. Uh, yeah, what I've just been saying now was said absolutely beautifully by Herda, who is a critique of the Enlightenment, uh, the Enlightenment, the um, romantic critique of the Enlightenment. In reality, every mutable thing has within itself the measure of its time. No, world, no two worldly things have the same measure of time. Therefore, there are at any one time in the universe innumerably many times. Now, um, in his wonderful book, um, Carbon Democracy, um, Timothy Mitchell uh, talks about the positing of the democracy that we have um, on the availability, of it, um, infinite availability of, um, of fossil fuels. And he makes a couple of really interesting arguments here. One is that we couldn't have had the infrastructure building that we had in the 1920s and 30s without fossil fuels. But also we couldn't have had the social theories um, that really grew up in, in, in that world of complete um, um, energy surplus, um, such as the theories of Karl Marx or the theories of John Maynard Keynes. So it's not only about the organization of society, it's also about the ways in which we think the world and the ways in which we uh, get to interact with the world. Now, um, Dominique Boulier has been making this wonderful argument that we're moving into new kinds of social fact now. The social facts of the 19th century were first like Emile Durkheim, where very strict classification systems which fed into censuses and all that good stuff and then fed back into, into social policy um, and the reification of these social facts. Um, what he talks about is the new kind of social fact which is occurring through big data and interconnection um, is vibrations. It's a much, much faster rhythm. It's a much, much faster feedback loop. It's a different kind of feedback loop. So we need to be able to theorize these new kinds of social facts in order to address the fundamental ways in which big data is changing who we are and how we interact in the world. Thank you. Since we have a quieter room than we used to, can we try our questions without the mic being passed around? OK, let's try it. Questions? So I have a question about the technology of this big data. Um, so this data is all like digital, it's being held on servers and whatnot, and it's so much of our lives are being like permeated um, in terms of society, um, like the social, political, economic, we're all sort of permeated by this big data um, information that previously would have been held in like archives and libraries, as you sort of alluded to at the beginning of the talk. What are the, I guess, implications for future historians who want to read this data and no longer have the technology to do so? Uh, that, that, is a, that is a question which has been uh, troubling um, a lot of librarians and ex-librarians for the longest time now. It's a very difficult question to answer. Um, basically what you need to do when you've got these huge data archives is you need to be able to port them into the new technology. Um, and you need to be able to, not only porting the data, you need to port the, the algorithms that you're using to analyze the data, the programs that you're running on the data. And that porting is incredibly expensive. It's generically an unfunded mandate. Um, like you funded um, in an NSF program, I'm funded to make my data public. I'm not funded to make it persist. Um, and that idea of persistence um, is one that the, the, the technical community has not solved the persistence issue right yet. Um, right now, it's, it, it's incredibly difficult to understand how this is going to work in the future. Um, I mean, um, an acid free paper book, uh, its generic life is over 2,000 years. Um, the magnetic tape was something like, um, I think, 40 years. Um, CDs, uh, CD-ROMs, the 50 years or whatever, although there was a scare a few years ago, they were all going to um, crash together. Uh, we, d we don't have permanent storage technology. We don't really know how to envisage what that would be. It's a sort of, I mean, it's sort of like the equivalent, if you like, of the, um, of the Mitchell argument there, um, that because everything seems to be getting cheaper all the time now, because memory seems to be getting cheaper all the time, and computers are getting faster all the time. There's this kind of blind optimistic belief that we won't run into preservation problems. Um, we, are, we will absolutely run into preservation problems. Yeah. So you, um, you, you framed the talk in terms of a, a revolution as like the hand around the clock, a cyclical emotion, right? Mm -hmm. But w within 
um, within some of the, I think it was like a marketing piece or a media piece at the beginning, it was the, the revolution of predictive policing. The, the other revolution as though we're moving into something that's, that's new, Yeah. right? Um, I, I'm interested in, is this just a rhetorical move? You brought up ANT and uh, the, the use of revolution as perhaps a way of enrolling into, uh, into this new, better way of doing things and, and maybe how that works with you know, I think it's it's fairly easy to see that this is related to ANT or related to cybernetics. But is this also simply a, a revolution, a cyclical revolution back to behavioralism? Like, is this a new redu a new form of, of, of sort of highly reductionist uh, tendencies to understanding people and the way we act? Sorry, I can only keep one question in my mind yeah, sorry, <laughs> at a time. And there were some really interesting issues there, so. Um, not for you, but I'm going to pull my notebook out for future questions. Um, well, all right, let me first of all do the, um, give them the opportunity, so I'm going to do the actual network theory riff yeah. first, and then I'll go into the question of what kind of a revolution we're talking about. Um, the the actual network theory goes that many people in actual network theory, including many of its progenitors, don't realize that actual network theory came out of cybernetics. But it came out of cybernetics through um, a principle that I call discontinuous transmission, which I want to write about at some stage. You had the towering figure of Michel Serre, who kind of stood in the middle. And he was a cybernetician in the 1950s and 60s, um, who then wrote this series of absolutely brilliant books. And out of, out of those books came a lot of the fundamental concepts of actor network theory. Um, but Latour, Bruno Latour, who's reading actor network, who's reading Serre, doesn't get the connection between SER and cybernetics. Um, and so many of the themes in actor network theory, like the black box, um, like the flattening of the actants, which also comes out of semiotics, also um, comes out of cybernetics. Um, with respect to the nature of the revolution that's going on, and the analogy that I draw here is a little bit like um, Foucault's got a great argument about democracy is not the same thing uh, if you've got a different substrate of technology. Um, so you can't talk, Paul Vane writes about this, you can't talk about the rise of democracy in a clear line from Greek times to the present day. It just makes absolutely no sense. Um, because meeting together in the all ting or the Icelandic ting or the agora, when you're all in an unmediated space together, is really, really not the same uh, as Jonathan, uh, Richard John makes this point about the post office in the 19th century. We wouldn't have had a country in America and we wouldn't have a national discourse about politics without the post, postal service and without the penny post for newspapers, which enable a national discourse to be built up. And so democracy in America becomes a very, very different thing because of the postal service. And all I'm arguing, you know, on the revolutionary side of my argument, what I'm arguing there is, yes, we are constituting ourselves very differently. And this technology is constituting our politics and our souls very differently. So I really do believe that it's uh, I really do believe that it's making a major difference. Um, now, what I have argued, and this goes back to your question about the um, uh, your question about the um, resurgence of behaviorism. Uh, yeah, I actually wrote a paper <laughs> about this a little while ago. It's, you know, we're all going back into skin and boxes and like, mm. if you like, because big data is just interested in inputs and outputs. Doesn't really care what happens in the middle, um, providing you you know the appropriate stimulus, appropriate response. You know, see it, click it, buy it. Um, you know, that's, that's straight behaviorism. Um, now, I've told this story in two temporalities. I'm really not, I haven't quite worked out the language yet to describe both of them. But what I see is, um, you know, all of this story that I've been telling is absolutely consonant uh, with what's been going on since the late, uh, early 19th, late 18th centuries, when the, when the vast uh, censuses and natural history surveys started, and geological surveys collecting data, using that data as a, as a means of control, prediction and control. So there's a story that goes back over a couple of hundred years. There's a story that goes back just to cybernetics, and there's a story that goes back to big data. And I actually see it, you know, it's, it's more like Ptolemaic than anything else. It's, you know, cycles within cycles within cycles, so there's always happy cycles going on. And we do return back frequently um, to bits from the past, or we express them in new ways, but I absolutely see continuity there. One more. Yeah, um, great talk, by the way. Um, you talked a lot about the impact of big data on society and citizens at large, and I was wondering 
if I could hear your thoughts about the use of like computational social science in a research domain and this kind of idea of doing predictive analytics to theorize and build theory in that sense and what the implications of that are, I think. I'm not certain I'm going to be able to get the best possible response to that, but, but let me say, um, so you think of computational social science in the sense of yeah. taking data? Like in the sense like we're learning is what, the way big data is working now, we're like we're learning things about ourselves and society at large, but using that predictive analysis to say like, oh, this set of inputs creates this phenomenon observed, like computational social science, I guess, if you understand. All right, let, let me give a couple of responses. I mean, I mean, this is the vision, if you like, of uh, Isaac Asimov in the Foundation tr Trilogy, you know, that you know, sociology would become the major, the major science, and it would be, become the science through prediction. Um, when um, Norbert Wiener writes the introduction to cybernetics in 1956 or wherever, his opening paragraph is about the social is going to be the hardest nut to crack. Um, and we really need to, you know, we really need our cybernetic systems to, to tackle the social, but we won't be able to do it for a number of years yet. Physical systems are much easier. Exactly the same argument, by the way, that uh, August Comte makes in the early 19th century, uh, where he says that sociology will be the, you know, the, the hardest of the sciences, because we already know maths, we already know physics, but we don't really know sociology. Um, I do believe that we can do really interesting new kinds of sociology through, you know, through computational social science. Um, and we can also, I'm going to give a slightly tangential response, um, uh, just because I was thinking about it today and see if I can hook it up. Uh, there's a brilliant book that came out uh, last year or the year before by Pete Dabola um, called um, The Architecture of Concepts. And what The Architecture of Concepts does, it uses... Um, um, uses um, an analysis of the whole ECHO database. The ECHO database is the database of all 18th century literature. There's Nines does 19th century literature, ECHO does 18th century, all English language literature. And what he did was he um, did a cluster analysis of, um, of words uh, which were associated with the concept of rights. And he traces how rights has a completely different meaning um, at, the begin at the beginning of the century, different set of associations from at the end of the century. Now, what's interesting about that is um, Michel Foucault comes up with this, this idea of discourse and the discourse of society, which is about the set of possible statements. Um, it's not about he said, he said, she said, which is a traditional form of intellectual history. But using this computational device, you're actually able to get through to a much clearer idea uh, of Foucault's concept of the archive as the set of all possible statements than you could possibly have got before you were using the computational techniques. Um, now, the computational techniques are already being used in control mechanisms in all sorts of ways. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about that. Uh, one project you might want to look at is, is uh, oh, a Deep Dive at Stanford. Uh, we had someone give a talk here a few years ago. Um, Deep Dive, I think, is highly problematic um, but it's certainly into this kind of social engineering aspect. So. Okay, let's thank him again.